Joellen Lampman is our Extension Support Specialist with the New York State IPM program. She wears many hats. Um, she's our turf grass and school IPM specialist and also our tick expert. Uh, today, Joellen will be talking about a very hot topic uh, and give us the scientific perspective on the concept of no mow may. So take it away, Joellen. Thank you. I am very excited to be uh, addressing this topic. It's caused some really lively discussions in, in groups. Um, so the idea of, of no mow May is to avoid mowing in May to allow early flowers. Dandelion is kind of being the poster child for no mow May. And these early flowers are going to provide a vital food source for bees. Uh, so it's catchy, it's easy to remember title, it tells you what it wants to do. And like I mentioned, this caused some really lively discussions with the Cornell Turf team uh, and, and beyond. So first of all, I would love to know who's here today because um, it's going to help form the, the conversation. So what has attracted you to this topic? So these are a little bit exaggerated, but um, I would like you to put into the chat which team you're on. So if your team, I love my lawn and I want it to look good, then you would put down A. Uh, if you really would do anything, be a within reason to help the pollinators do the team D. Um, team C, I'm calling uh, team lazy. Uh, team D is, this is all confusing. I just want somebody to tell me what to do. So this is team confused. And then E is none of the above. So that's team pick your own adventure. And if you want to kind of figure out what you are and put that in the chat, I would greatly appreciate it. We're seeing a mixed bag, C, B, uh, C, B, D, B, B, D, C. So um, I don't see any A's. I see one E, a lot of D's and B's. So okay, we got a mixed, a mixed so group. So I'm, I'm <laughs> full disclosure. I'm I'm clearly team lazy. So if I can find the reason not to do something, I'm absolutely going to take it. And if you're on social media, you, you might have seen this meme going around, like we're doing all of these things to help the pollinators and finding excuses not to do those things that really do need to get done. So thank you for filling that out. Um, that is going to be really helpful. So um, let's talk a little bit about how it started. And I just want to mention that I consider this to be a group effort between the Cornell Turf team. They really came forward. We've been having these discussions. They provided me with photos. And Cornell Cooperative Extension of Westchester has just released a fact sheet that talks about the beginning of NOMO May. They have a lot of resources linking to research that I'm not going to have time to cover today. So that link is going in the chat. And I would encourage you uh, to check out that fact sheet. So basically this started in 2019 with a British organization who decided to start a citizen science project to have people not mow portions of their lawn and then go in and then count the flowers that were in there. Uh, so to be clear, this was not a, this is a best management practice. We should let our lawns grow tall because it's gonna help the pollinators. This is a, let's see what's gonna happen and we're gonna get all these people involved to help us make that decision. Um, somebody heard about this in Appleton, Wisconsin, and they also got on board and they had almost 500 properties that were involved and there was a research project around that as well. So because this happened in Britain, that was my first question. It's like Britain has very different climate than we do in the Northeast. So is what going to work in Britain going to work here? So I did my Google searching and, and I just love this, um, th this quote that came from a travel site. So probably not the best place to get um, scientific information, but London is just London all the time. And if you look at those average temperatures in London, the difference between the average winter temperature and the average summer temperature is only 30 degrees. Not a big difference there compared to New York City, where the difference can be 50 or uh, 60 degrees, uh, much more dramatic. And that's not even getting into rainfall and how rain falls. So what, ha what works in Britain is not necessarily going to work here in, in New York much less the United States where no mow may has really become a big topic throughout the entire country. 
So it has gained traction. Um, my colleague, Carl Scaminti, had uh, threw this up in a presentation he was doing, and I liked it. So I did the same search. So this was a Google search term. We're assessing it. What is the percentage of people that are out there that are that are looking for no mome? Uh, and you can see that 2020 people hadn't really heard about it. 2022, it really took off. There's a lot of interest that remained through 2023 when we started to hear some pushback against no mome. And then now in 2024, they're still gathering that data. Now, if the whole purpose of no mome is to help the pollinators, I was like, well, let me try a different search term. Um, so really we're talking about pollinator lawns. So I dumped that in and it just doesn't nearly have the traction that no mome has. So what's the difference? I think that this is just a really great title. Um, so no mome, it's a catchy tune, but can you dance to it? So let's look at what the results were uh, from those two initial projects that started. So that initial plant life citizen science projects, the results weren't great. They found that there was no significant increase in nectar sugar by June, which is when, according to you know, the parameters, we would start mowing again. And they only saw really significant increases when they left that lawn unmowed until July. Well, now we're talking about a completely different project. Um, we're no longer talking about having a lawn that's going to last because if you're leaving it up, you're not gonna be able to um, have a lawn and, and do all the things that you do on lawns. With the Appleton, Wisconsin study, that gets a little bit more complicated. They did publish a study, and I think that was the reason that it really took off because they were touting all of the great benefits of no mome, um, but then it was put under some scrutiny and that paper was actually retracted. So the result that they showed weren't actually, they were very questionable to the point that it was pulled from the publication. So, you know, we're not convinced uh, as a Cornell Turf team, we have questions. So we're doing the research ourselves and we're taking our time with it. And uh, we're doing multi-year studies. So here's very preliminary results um, from mowing that happened last year, mowing regimes. So one of the left, these are recent pictures. Um, so this was a, um, plot where they mowed it weekly throughout the entire growing season. The one on, I'm sorry, the one on the left, they mowed weekly. The one on the right, they did no mow May, and then they started to mow weekly. And what's really interesting here, I know it's hard to see here, but the one on the left where they mowed weekly the entire season has a lot of ground ivy in it. We don't. We can't explain this. We don't understand it. That's why we're going to continue this study and, and look at it into the future. Um, another colleague is uh, looking at mowing heights and how it relates. So here from these pictures, you can see from the far left, we have, um, it was mowed at three and a half inches and the daily lines are doing just great. They're able to survive that mowing when it was taken down to three inches, uh, we still have quite a bit of dandelions that are able to survive that. And it wasn't until two inch height of cut that we reduced um, the flowering from the dandelions in, in those plots. So again, this is something we're gonna continue to look at and, and track over longer periods of time. Now, some less scientific observations that I myself did uh, this past weekend, I was at a nature preserve. I was there to check out the spring ephemerals in the woodlands, but I was also walking along this path where it was a meadow area. And the only place, the only place where there were flowers in this meadow was in the mowed path strip. We had a whole conversation about this with the turf team. Is it flowering? Is stress-induced response to traffic? Is traffic thinning competition and allowing the plants to flower? Is the mowing opening up that canopy so that the flowering plants can flourish? These are the questions that we're asking and we're going to continue to ask and try to get answers for. Uh, this is another observation. This is actually my own backyard where I allow uh, most of it to be natural and it's growing up tall. Again, the only flowers that are in my yard right now are in the mode sections. And this has been mowed this year. My husband is definitely not on board with no mow May, so he's out there 
And you can see the dandelions. There's also uh, ground ivy, dead nettle, and wild strawberries that are flowering, but only in the mowed portions. And just a note about the dandelion, uh, again, the poster child for Nomo May, it has adapted to our mowers. It's doing just fine, even if we're mowing. So if we're trying to say, let's leave dandelions for the bees, that's gonna happen whether we mow or not. So if we're not providing that pollinator benefit and the questions are still there, what are some of the other issues that might come up? So we have, um, the lawn itself. So right now, May is when it is growing gangbusters. It is taking off. We have lots of moisture in the system right now. The grass is growing really, really quickly. Uh, two years ago, I did an IPM Minute on mowing. And um, so this slide came from there. We're going to put that chat in. Uh, I'm not getting into the details other than we are strong proponents that if you want a healthy lawn, you never want to cut off more than one third inch of one third of the leaf blade. And you can see when we get down to the, the taller heights of cut that in nine days, it's grown two inches. So what's going to happen if we don't mow for 30 days? How high is that going to be? And that's the average during, you know, over the entire growing season here in the springtime when it's really growing quickly, we need to mow every five days in order to only be cutting off one third of the leaf blade. And if we don't do that, then we're going to get clumps and huge amounts of clippings. And Jody's gonna cover that um, following me. So I'm not gonna get any more into that other than what's gonna happen on June 1st. And every time that I've seen somebody promoting no mo may, I ask them the same question. What are we supposed to do on June 1st? And I have never gotten an answer. Um, I have a, a good lawnmower that goes up to four inches high. It is not going to go through grass that is a foot high, foot and a half, maybe two feet tall by June 1st. And even if it could, it's not doing it that without severely damaging the lawn quality. And I just want to throw in a, a you know shout out for lawns. They can provide many benefits. They are cooling in the summer. They can slow down runoff. They're allowing that water to soak into the soil. They're controlling erosion. This only happens if we have a good solid stand of lawn. And then this is also the social aspects of it. The main one being that you can play on lawns in a way that you just cannot play in meadows. And then if you're still not team turf, I get it. Um, but here's another question that came up that I don't know that anybody's really looked at yet. What happens to the other things besides pollinators that don't fly? So we've got these tall grass areas. Things are going to start to move into them. So we've got frogs that may or may not be able to escape that lawnmower. Ground nesting birds, those eggs are certainly not getting out of the way. What's happening to them? So what does this all mean? No mate is a great conversation starter. Some have referred to it as a gateway drug to further pollinator habitat enhancement. But if it's merely feel good and not actually benefiting pollinators, and, and that's still questionable, and possibly causing these other unintended negative consequences, what are those long-term impacts? Is this something we really want to be uh, promoting? I learned a new term this week, re researching for this uh, talk, bee washing. So that link is going in. This paper does not specifically mention no mo may, but it does warn against those easy, low-hanging fruit solutions that are actually not going to be helpful in the long run. So it was, it was uh, worth looking at for me. So let's go back to that interest. No Mo May has a lot of interest, I think because of the catchy title. Um, I would like to offer an alternative. I did a, another search assessment and Bee Lawns actually got a lot of interest over greater amounts of time. Last year, I did a presentation on a Bee Lawn demonstration site that we set up at the Cornell Cooperative Extension Office in Voorheesville. These are pictures that I took yesterday and we've got loads of uh, daisies that are in bloom that are able to 
flower at a mowing height. Now we've got pollinators visiting them. Um, we have our 2024 conference coming up on fruit and berry IPM that's going to take place at the Extension Office in um, Albany County on June 27th. So if you come to that in person, you'll also be able to check out these bee lawns. Now, this takes a lot of work and my presentation goes into that. But if you're like me and I'm team lazy, I haven't done this at home because it's a lot of work. So if you wanna do something that might be helpful to the pollinators, let's tweak Nomo May. We might be better off with Nomo April. Um, not the same catchy title, but probably more appropriate for the Northeast. And I've heard a hint that if you plant bulbs directly into your lawn, and you're not supposed to mow until those leaves have died back, that's probably going to be happening around now. So you'll still be able to mow um, at the time of year where we're not going to really make the lawn health suffer. And then another alternative um, that we're considering with the turf team is mow high May, June, and July. This comes with the change of the aesthetic of allowing and embracing those spontaneous lawn flowers that pop up in our lawns throughout the growing season. And it's not going to stop on June 1st, but it's gonna continue on throughout the season. So your turn. What do you think? What do you think you're, you will do to help pollinators in the year? Please uh, pop some of your ideas in the chat. If you have an absolutely catchy term that will uh, help us overcome the catchiness of Nomo May, I'd love to see that as well. And while you are doing that, I just want to thank the Cornell Type Tur Turf team for their lively discussions and photos on Nomo May. I want to thank Cooperative Extension of Westchester County for putting it all in that fact sheet. Um, and also just a shout out for the bee lawn demo, uh, the people that helped to uh, actually get that in as well as to fund it. All right, are there any questions? I'm not seeing any questions just yet, Joellen, but you've, you're getting a lot of great feedback about what people are planning to do. So some uh, somebody said that they're gonna mow around the flowers, um, that the bees are using so that, you know, they're not eliminating that, that resource. Planting lots of flowers. Uh, um, question just came in about how high uh, to mow for mowing high. Basically the recommendation is as high as your mower will go. So for most mowers, that's going to be three inches, um, three and a half if, if it goes that high. Mine goes up to four inches and I specifically searched that out because uh, I really wanted to, to have that go as high as it possibly could because I'm lazy and I want to mow less often. Another question was, uh, could a person mow the flower, then plant other non-native flowers to make up for it? So I'm not sure what they're asking at that point. I, I will say that most of the things that are going to pop up if we just stop mowing, are non-native plants. So if native is important to you, then um, putting that into a separate garden or a sectioning off part of your lawn and trying to establish a more native uh, plant meadow would be better for the pollinators. And I think something you covered in your your pollinator meadow presentation was about having flowering resources throughout the year. So there, there are native plants that are going to flower at different times through the year to continuously provide those resources. Absolutely. But not in that lawn mix. Right. None of our native plants are going to flower at three inches high. Uh, so, so this question is definitely for you. Um, Scott knows you well. <laughs> so did you come across any concerns from bad bugs like ticks that might increase during no mow may? So we really haven't seen that. Um, basically, if you have lawn that is adjacent to woods and there's shade there, you're going to have ticks and it doesn't really matter what you're doing with it. It's not going to make it any better or any worse. They like that 80% humidity and, and they're going to be there if they have woods that they can come out of. Excellent. Well, thank you, Joellen. Um, we'll keep an eye out for other questions that come in and either you can answer them in the chat or if we have time at the end, um, we can go ahead and ask you. 
Um, at this time, we'll ask our next presenter to bring up their slides. And next up is Dr. Jody Gangloff Kaufman. And Jody is the Associate Director at the New York State IPM Program and the Coordinator for Community IPM. Um, and as Joellen alluded, today Jody will cover another aspect of lawn care that can affect the environment. And she'll, so she'll be talking about what to do with grass clippings. Take it away, Jody. A smarter way to use grass clippings. Um, I might be preaching to the choir here, but uh, it's sometimes hard to convince people to do things differently. Um, to my next slide. So as Joellen mentioned, right now we're in the midst of the uh, majority of growth of turf grass. So I know my yard, the grass is growing really crazy. And 60% um, of all the top growth is in the first six weeks of the warm weather season. And that's also when the root growth uh, happens as well. So, um, you know, we're, we're looking at how to manage all this grass. And springtime mowing can produce a lot of clippings, especially if you've waited too long and, um, you know, it's a wet day or something like that. You can produce clippings that might smother the lawn. So what do we do with all these clippings? Um, what choices are there? Well, this choice right here, I see this a lot, especially in suburbia. Mow those clippings, collect them in a bag and discard them. And this material may end up in a landfill or an incinerator or... Um, depending on where you live, and it's simply more work and um, not as sustainable. That's not a really great way to use uh, something like this, this natural resource we have. Maybe a better choice would be mow and collect, add it to the compost, and hey, create new soil. You know, and composting can be limited for some people who don't have the room for a compost pile, um, and it's still also more work to manage a compost pile and to do it correctly. This, you know, has to be interspersed with brown material, um, because grass clippings are pretty rich, right? Why not leave the clippings on the lawn then? Why not? Well, I get a lot of pushback. Leaving clippings on the lawn will damage the lawn. Well, you know, yeah, if you have this clumpiness like uh, like I showed in the first picture or this clump here, you could end up with damage on the lawn and it might look ugly. So the re remedy for that is to mow more frequently in the spring period of growth as Joellen demonstrated uh, we have to mow probably every five days or something when the grass is growing really fast. Don't do no mow May. <laughs> but um, only mow when it's dry out. That's a really important point because dry clippings will filter down through the canopy of the grass to the soil. And you can mow the clippings a second time to break them down further. Um, but, you know, uh, so we can avoid leaving clumps of clippings on the lawn if we do it right. Now, the other thing I hear a lot is lawn clippings become thatch. I have friends who are obsessed with dethatching their lawn. Uh, well, the truth is clippings do not contribute to thatch. Thatch happens to be a dense layer of stems and um, other material that lay on top of the soil and are formed because of an imbalance of fertility, uh, of acidity, and also compaction and the, um, the lack of microorganisms to break down that thatch that would normally be there. Thatch restricts the movement of air and water and nutrients into the soil. So we don't want thatch, but um, it usually doesn't happen, doesn't happen too often on regular um, low maintenance lawns. It's common, I guess, more in the um, golf course world, but uh, thatch is bad. Grass clippings don't contribute to that. Grass clippings are mostly water and through decomposition, and a nice balance, you know, soil profile, they, uh, the clippings actually feed the good microorganisms that eventually will break down thatch. So clippings also can inhibit weed germination and they eventually help build healthy soils. Now, the nutrients in clippings, that's another reason to leave them on the, the lawn here. Um, 4%, I think this is by weight, Lawn clippings are 4% nitrogen, they're 2% potassium, 1% phosphorus, and this is about 25% of the lawn's nutrient needs. So why fertilize when you can just return the clippings to the soil? Why would you throw that away? <laughs> um, that's probably number one reason, money. Don't buy fertilizer. <laughs> You can also take clippings that are excess and mulch flower beds with them. It forms a pretty good, lawn clippings form a pretty good mulch. You don't want it to be too thick because it can um, uh, fail to dry out and, um, and form, you know, might form too much of a mat under there. 
Uh, just a reminder to sharpen your mower blades each season. Unsharpened mower blades will rip the grass apart, and that results in uh, the loss of water and potential disease intrusion for the lawn. So once a season or after every 10 hours, um, be sure to, to sharpen your blades. And uh, happy mowing. That's it for me. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Great, thank you, Jody. Um, we do have time for a one minute response to one question. And the one that came in was, um, have you heard about people being concerned about spreading weeds throughout their lawn by leaving the clippings? Um, so, you know, if they have weed seeds or uh, seed heads, they wanna remove all that material um, and put it somewhere else after they cut. Is that a concern? Um, right now I can see a lot of lawns that have dandelion seed heads sticking up. <laughs> in my neighborhood i noticed it the other day and anytime i i see that i mean that's probably the most prominent kind of weed you'd find in lawns and worry about because the seeds get everywhere um so yeah i mean you might take your lawnmower once and, and take off those seed heads and throw that away um but otherwise i'm not sure how many seeds are really out there in the lawn for the weeds when you're mowing consistently you know yeah, one one response was that um, the seeds that are germinating are often from seeds that are there for a long time. So, you know, if you have a nice, good, dense uh, vegetation, you're unlikely to allow those seeds to germinate. Great. Well, I want to thank uh, Joellen and Jody for two great presentations. I think they gave us something to think about for the month of May ahead.